thank you for coming and listening to our talk on implicit bias. We have a very special presenter today, Dr. Kimberly Reynolds, who is a board certified pediatrician and has dedicated her life's work to improving the lives of children in South Florida. She is currently an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at the Host Children Hospital and treats various inpatient conditions. She also dedicates her academic scholarship to cultural competence and implicit bias. She has published in premier journals and has conducted trainings on cultural competence and implicit bias. She has presented her work at national and international conferences and has been recognized for her outstanding commitment to educational scholarship through the Academic Pediatric Association Educational Scholars Program. Welcome, Dr. Reynolds. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me here um, to talk to you guys about implicit bias. Um, I recognize a lot of faces in the room, but maybe not everyone. Um, has anyone heard my talk before? A couple. Who, who has? All of you. <laughs> my goodness. Okay. Who hasn't heard my talk before? Okay. So a few people. And then who is like not quite sure what implicit bias is? I think all of you guys are like, I'm okay, all right, awesome, that's cool, that's cool. Um, okay, so what I'll do, I'm glad I asked because I, I can sort of speed through kind of like the basics a little bit um, and then talk a little bit more about what to do about it, if that would be like helpful for you guys. Awesome, okay, great, cool, all right. So today we'll define implicit bias define implicit associations, utilize the IAT, um, understand how implicit bias contributes to health disparities, and then I added a little part at the end, um, I just did that, but I'm glad I did, where we'll actually go about um, talking about how to address implicit bias. Okay, so for those of you who have seen my talk before, I have, I have actually changed my awareness test, so this is gonna be a new one. So let's see if this works out for us. Okay, so I want you guys to tell me, I'm gonna make it bigger. I want you guys to tell me if you can spot the pickpocket. So someone is about to be robbed <laughs> here. I want you guys to tell me, and do this, like talk out loud like to yourselves. Like if you see something, say something, and let us know, and then we'll try to figure out if we can figure out who the pickpocket is together. What are you guys seeing that's suspicious so far? Anything? So this this lady, right? I don't know why, for some reason, my eye was on her like the whole time. The guy in the red shirt, the bad shirt. Where is he? Oh, him? Okay. Well, he's gone. He's gone. So let's see. He's stealing stuff from the cook, though. I think that's his bag. That's his bag. <laughs> <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> Oh, her. Precious. She's too nervous. Why is she suspicious? She's getting close to people like that. Okay, so she's getting a little bit too close. Okay. <laughs> what else are you guys seeing? Mm -hmm. um, she's looking at everyone. The one in the red? The red purse? Yeah, that's who her. That's what we're talking I'm about. talking about the red, the one in the pink. Oh, her. Yeah. Okay. No, the guy in the black, he just keeps walking around on his phone. Okay, so there's a guy in the black on a phone. He may be anxious. He might be anxious. Okay. <laughs> 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 right? 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 <laughs> a story for everybody <laughs> in the video. Okay. What else do you guys see? Uh, Why are you with so their bodies? I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're hungry. This is Chipotle. Right? No. No. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get that close. That's totally so. Okay. Then there's these people over here. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. But everyone agree that it's somebody up here, yes. right? Somebody up here is about to do something. It's going to be the, the woman in the class. The guy in the black didn't even get food. Wait, what happened? It happened already. The guy in the black didn't even get food. Wait, you saw something? Go back. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me what you see. Stand up and who who saw something? Stand up. Okay, what did you see? Tell me. 
I could have sworn I saw the gentleman in the black holding the coat. Uh -huh. He walked. It's like I saw his hand reach out. Okay. Again. Okay. okay. So yeah. Just... Let's see. So they haven't walked out yet. Let's see if when he. So this guy's walking out. There he is. There, there, is. Is. Oh. there it is. There it is. He didn't. That was it. You're the first person to ever like actually see that. Usually, people are like, "Oh no, this lady!" Like everyone thinks it's like these people right here. Um, and then we usually have to go back. So yeah. It couldn't have been the lady in the purse though, because she was very readjusting her purse, meaning she was either Nervous. aware of something or trying yeah, to take care of this her one. Purse she's holding her purse yeah. way too that? tight. She yeah. is. And then the other two ladies are too. But hard. everybody is like so close together, so maybe she's just like, why are these people so close to me? I don't know, but it definitely that was the guy. That was the guy. Good. So that's uh, you. So I've never had anyone actually see it before. Um, but then once you see it. You're like, how could I have missed that, right. right? So the whole purpose of this is that it's easy to miss something that you're not looking for, right? So implicit bias is that thing. I want to convince you by the end of the day that implicit bias is that thing that's, um, that's affecting all of our interactions on a day-to-day -day basis, and we just might not actually see it because it's unconscious. But did anyone see the dancing elephant in the clip? Huh? Did you see the dancing I'm just like, I'm like, wait a minute! Okay, so what do you notice about this picture? Has anyone seen this picture before? Okay, so what do you notice about it? So this is the American Red Cross. This is their Be Cool, Follow the Rules campaign. It was a national campaign that they put out a few years ago. What do you notice? The whales the talking in the sand. Whale. A talking whale. There's a whale that's <laughs> jumping. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> but these are for kids, right? Yeah. Is the lifeguard on the right on their phone? I'm sorry? Is the lifeguard on the right on their phone? No, he's just just one. One. Oh, okay, because it looks for me like they're on their phone. Oh, no, no, no. no. Everyone's sort of like doing yeah, cool no, stuff. The dark skinned kids, kids are not cool. The dark skinned kids are not cool. Do you guys see that? Yeah, they're breaking their well, there's a not, cool. Not, cool. Not, cool. not cool. Not cool. Not cool. He's also not cool, right? So, fair enough, right? But there's no cool child that's not light skinned or, or white. Right? So the American Red Cross actually put this campaign out and got huge backlash. Right? Huge. Like, I mean, they had to retract it. They issued an apology. Um, and, you know, they, what did they say? They said, we didn't intend any harm, right? And they didn't. I truly, truly believe that the American Red Cross in this case, the folks who put together this campaign were sort of like, let's put this out. You know, let's make the, the case for why we need pool safety. And, you know, what are some safe things to do at the pool? But they had a blind spot, right? So that when they looked at this, they did not see that there was a problem. And so I am not calling the American Red Cross bad, right? Because they did this. They are human, right? They made a mistake. But this, this is the kind of thing that can happen when we are not conscious about our implicit biases. Here's another one. So this is actually, this was published in a, in a, has anyone ever seen this one before? This one was published um, in, a, in, a, in a children's um, textbook um, for, for kindergarten. Um, and as you can see, sad and angry, right? So these are the messages that our kids and that we have gotten pretty much our whole life, right? And you look at this and sometimes you don't even really realize that you are getting that message. And that's what implicit bias is. So let's talk about what it is. So bias is a positive or negative evaluation of one group and its members relative to another. And there's two ways you can think about bias. We can think about bias as a, an expression or a cognitive process. And we're going to talk about bias today as a cognitive process, but it's helpful to talk about it as an expression first. So a direct way of expressing your bias would be to walk into a room like this and just to blurt out, I like working with redheads more than brunettes. I don't know why anyone would do that, but let's say you did, right? That would be you directly expressing your bias, right? You are aware of it, you're conscious, and, and you are pretty much probably okay with it because you're expressing it. An indirect way would be to walk into a room like this and you sit further away from a brunette than a redhead. So I haven't told you whether or not you did that on purpose, right? 
you might not even realize that you did that. So that's why it's less helpful to think about bias as an expression. And it's more helpful to think about bias as a cognitive process. And we have explicit and implicit bias. Can you guys hear me? Or you guys, okay, perfect. So we're talking about implicit bias, but it's helpful to know what explicit bias is first. So that would be when a person is aware of his or her evaluation of a group, believes that value to be correct, and acts on that value in some manner. So that would manifest as overt discrimination. So this would be an employer saying, I am only hiring redheads, right? I'm only hiring redheads, brunette, don't even apply, right? I'm not even going to pick up your application. That would be overt discrimination, such as in hiring practices, like I mentioned. So... I, I say this with a little, little, it's a, a little bit of caution <laughs> that it is now considered to be unacceptable by general society. When I put that slide together, um, what I mean is that there used to be sort of like state-sanctioned explicit bias, right? Like it was, it was overt and it was, it was out there, right? So now people are a little bit more covert even when they have explicit bias, right? They're gonna be a little bit more covert with it, but it still does happen. That's why we have offices that, you know, and, and lawyers that only do discrimination law, right? So it still happens, but in general society, it's considered unacceptable. Implicit bias is the thing that we don't really talk about as much. And it's a positive or negative mental attitude toward a person, thing, or group that a person holds at an unconscious level. And that is really the key, is that it's unconscious and it's unintentional. So the manifestations thus are going to be subtle, right? So this is not someone saying, I'm not going to sit next to you, right? This is someone walking in and deciding to sit somewhere, but not even really being aware of why they're doing that. This is someone not making eye contact, not giving you a firm handshake, not being a warm or friendly. You know when you speak to someone and you just kind of, you just get a vibe and you're like, huh, I wonder if I made a bad impression, but you don't really know that person. Sometimes it could be that there's some sort of bias at play. So most people don't go into a meeting and say, or wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be a jerk in that meeting today, right? I'm going to speak over all the women. Like, that's not usually what happens, right? It's even though that person is still speaking over all the women, right? They didn't intend to do it, right? So that's one way that bias can manifest itself. But the key is that is unintentional, and you do not necessarily know that you're doing it. So implicit associations are manifest as actions or judgments that are under the control of automatically activated evaluation. So these are the snap judgments that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. And we do this every single day, all the time. So when I... Um, walk into a room and I'm about to give a presentation. Let's say I'm in the hospital or over at the medical school and I'm about to give a presentation. Usually I walk in and people don't really know who I am, but when they see me, everyone doesn't like stand up and get on their guard, right? And they're ready to, to fight, right? Because they see certain things about me that make them think that even though they don't know who I am, I must belong here, right? So sometimes I'm wearing a white coat, and a white coat might communicate that I'm in the medical field of some sort, and I belong. I'm wearing an ID badge. Today I'm wearing a blazer, although I am wearing jeans, right? So I don't know, it's Friday, I just felt <laughs> um, But I'm wearing a blazer, right? So there's certain things about me that you have probably said, even if you didn't know me, you were like, I don't know who she is, but I'll, I'll you know, kind of stay around and see. But if someone is walking toward you on the street, and they have an angry look on their face and they're holding a machete, right? You're not gonna walk up to them and say, hi, how are you, nice to meet you, right? Like that's not gonna happen. You're gonna either be like on your guard or you're just gonna be like, oh, let me go the other way, right? You're gonna run. Um, so these are the snap judgments that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. So where do these associations come from? So our brains encounter countless data on a daily basis, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis and on a second-by-second -second basis. Um, so we have to have some way of filtering and organizing that information. So if you just think about all the things that are happening right now at this moment in time. So there's me yapping away to you, right? But there's also, I just heard some sort of like a plane or a helicopter or something going on outside. There's the temperature in the room. There's the lighting in the room. We're moving a chair around. Someone's walking around outside. Someone's writing with their pen. Like if you had to attend 
to all of these sources of, of information, you would really just be like this all day long, right? You wouldn't be able to focus on me. So what your mind does and does really well is that it says, I'm going to block out some of these this stimuli because this is innocuous. I don't need to pay attention to this. And I'm going to focus on the most important thing at the moment. So if somebody, if, you know, a loud noise were to go off, we would, I would probably stop talking. We would all shift our attention outside. So that's what we do. We have to organize and filter this information so that we can function efficiently. And so we make these associations, right? So if I say to you, this is always interesting. Um, if I say peanut butter, what do you say? It's always a medical no. allergy. <laughs> so outside of this campus, people say jelly. And then in this campus, everyone's like, allergy. Like we're always like kids and pediatrics and things like that. Um, okay, if I say, let's see. If I say banana, what do you say? Carbs. Someone said peanut butter. I heard peel. I heard potassium. I can't get away from it. <laughs> Okay, let's try this one. If I say grass, what do you say? Green, Green or outside. Or wait, what was the last one? Allergy. <laughs> also allergy. <laughs> okay. So, but there's an association, right, between those two things. And your brain readily put those things together. So some of you guys have, might have done this with me, but let's still go through it. So I'm going to show you four subway cars. And I want you, let's say it's the end of a long day. Um, you know, you've been working really hard and you're about to step on the subway and there's four cars coming toward you and you can choose which car. They're all coming at the same time and they're all going to get to your destination at the same time. So it's your choice which car you want to be in and then we can talk about it. So this is car number one, two, three, and four. So you guys already know which car you want to be in, right? Okay, so let's go through it for those who have not done this exercise with me. So subway car number one is very, very crowded. There's a lot of people and it's pretty much standing room only, right? So most people are like, I don't want to be on a subway. Like if I have my choice and like stand up and be crowded at the end of a long day, like who wants to do that? I just want to sit and scroll through Facebook, right? But there's also, there's always a couple of people, there's always like one or two who for some reason they look at this and it seems like home or, or it doesn't because they're like from New York or Chicago or something, or they don't have a problem with it because they say, you know what, there's safety in numbers. Is that, are you that person? Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> but you can see that. Is there anyone that likes one? Anyone that you like one? No, two. Oh, two. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about two. So subway car two. It's pretty crowded. It looks like there may be a couple of seats. Um, but the biggest thing is that there's a gentleman who's upside down in the middle of the car, right? Doing some sort of an acrobatic move. Um, right? So that's, that's happening. And then this guy is not happy with his choice. <laughs> He's not happy, right? So, so for subway car number two, most people say, you know, at the end of a long day, do I really want to sit next to a guy who might like kick me in the head? He's yeah. sleeping around. Like that seems like too much. I just want to sit and look at Instagram. I don't want to deal with this this character. But there's always a few people that are like, you know what, Dr. Reynolds, he's not bothering anyone. <laughs> and it's free entertainment. <laughs> who am I free entertainment for? Okay, see, there's always a few people. They, they're like, yeah, you know, why not? Why not watch somebody do some kind of fun stuff, right? That's that's pretty cool. Um Okay, so subway car number three. So the positives of subway car number three that I hear are that, number one, it looks like the cleanest subway car, and that's important to some people. And then number two, that the colors are aesthetically pleasing, right? Like it's bright and, and, and it looks better than the other cars. Yeah. I was actually going to go with, with the fourth one because actually I like the colors there more. Oh, in, in the fourth? Okay. I ended up with the third one because it's... It's daylight. It's daylight. It's bright. It just, it looks more inviting to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So some people like that car for that reason. And then there are folks like me who look at subway car number three and get palpitations. Why? Because there's one person in there. Not the colors. Because there's one person in there. So why am I nervous? 
Okay. You, don't know he's on. On. you don't know he's on. Well, that's true. <laughs> you don't know, yeah. One thing that I remember um, from a class I took that, I mean, the person's facing away from you, and I think it has to do with, like, with masks or why things are creepy or cute. It's like the uncanny valley where you feel nervous because you can't tell what the person's intentions are. Yeah, that's the thing. So if there were two people... I'd be fine, right? The chances of like two people being crazy in the car and violent, right? Um, are less, right? So, but this guy, like, what is that bag? Like, what does he have in there? There's a bag? There's a bag or something. Yeah, he's holding like, there's something. What if he has an ax in there and he's about to murder me, right? Like, I'm just saying, like, my mind, like, that's where my mind goes. And then my mind also says, there's no one in there to call 911. <laughs> I might have, right? So that's just my thought. But, like, again, a lot of people look at that and they're like, Dr. Reynolds, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I can just sit and scroll through Facebook and no one's going to bother me. So I was in um, Seattle last month giving this talk to a bunch of librarians. And when I got to number three... Everyone raised their hand. And I was like, why the heck do you guys want to be a number three, right? Because my bias is there were a lot of women in the room. And I thought to myself, surely women wouldn't want to be on a subway car with a sole man, right? That was my bias that I admit to. And they were like, Dr. Reynolds, we don't like people. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so subway car number four. This is the car that most people, when I give this talk, want to be in. Who wants to be in subway car number four? I like that. Not in this. Wait, which car did you guys want to be in? Maybe I'm missing. Three. Three. Wow. You guys are in. Oh, two and three. Oh, okay. That's an interesting. Okay, so when I give this talk, typically people want to be in four. And the reason that they say that is that there are enough seats, right, so that you could sit by yourself if you wanted to. But there's enough people on there, right? So that, like, if this... I always pick on this old guy. If he's the axe murderer, right? <laughs> <laughs> then at least there's a couple other people that might call 911. Um, so the whole point of this, this, like, little activity is to show that we do this all day long, right? Like, we make these snap judgments, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. In many instances, they help keep us safe, right? They help us move about our day, and they help us to attend to important information. It's just that sometimes when we, our brain does something well, it does it really, really well, and kind of, we kind of take it into overdrive. But these associations are automatic, and they're outside of the realm of consciousness. Right? So we are the descendants of people who did this really, really well. So on the African savanna, like eons ago, right? There were people, and they saw a lion walking toward them. They were able to say, okay, there's a lion. And then they saw the lion eat their friend, right? And then the next time they saw a lion, they didn't say, oh, my gosh, there's a lion. Oh, look, look at the lion. Look at his mane. It's so pretty. Oh, why is his mouth open? Oh, he's walking toward me. Now he's running. I wonder why he's running toward me, right? So, like, if that happened, I'm sure it did, right? Those people did not live to have offspring, right? So we are the descendants of the people that saw the lion eat their friend once. <laughs> and then the next time, what did we do? We either decided to fight or we fight, fight or fight. Exactly, right? So we do this well, and it's a good thing that we do it, and it's a human thing. It's a human thing that we do it. But we just have to be careful about how much we do it and in what context. Okay, so this is where I ask for a volunteer who is not colorblind, because I've been accused of having a bias against colorblind people. I apologize if anyone here is. Um, but I need a, a volunteer, maybe someone like toward the middle or the front, so you can actually see. Oh, you want to? Okay, cool. All right, awesome. What's your name? Antonio, okay. So Antonio, what I need you to do is on the next slide, I want you to read off the colors of the word. Don't read the word. Okay. Just say out loud the colors of the word as fast as you can. Okay. okay? Ready, set, go. Blue, green, brown, yellow, red. Perfect. You did a great job. Okay. Now I want you to do the same thing on the next slide, the colors, okay? As fast as you can. Ready, set, go. Brown, green, yellow, blue, red. Good. That was good. Antonio did it really fast, right? Did it feel different? Yeah. Why? I don't know. I saw green and I was like, wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, why? Let's, let's talk about why. I just looked at the letter. I was like, the first letter and I just, I didn't look at the rest. 
But when you first saw Green, right, and you were like, oh no, like what's happening? Like what, what do you think was going on? Or anyone? Sorry, there was like a misfire basically. There was a misfire. There's, this there's like usually like an erection where it's like you relate the word with the color. Right. And along with like, I guess like an image, like yellow, you think banana, but. Right. Yeah. So here, so thank you, Antonio. So what you did here is that there's an intact association between the word and the color, right? So we usually think of the sky as being blue and grass as being green, etc. Sunshine is yellow, right? And these are all sight words, right? So you, you're reading it. Your mind reads it as soon as you see it, right? But in the second one, I'm seeing the word green. I'm reading that, but the color of the word is brown, right? So there is, a, there is a, not an intact association, right? There's a discordant association between the two, and so what Antonio illustrates very well, though, is that even though he was feeling a little bit like, oh, oh no, what happened, right? What did we observe? He did it, right? He was able to do it. He didn't shut down completely. If we timed him, I bet you he was just a little bit longer the second time, right? And sometimes when people do this, like the first day, they say green right away without even realizing, right? So, but, so if we timed you, Antonio, you probably took a little bit longer the second time, but the key is you were able to do it. So even though there was a discordant association, you were able to overcome it, right? It just, it wasn't very easy. It was probably a little bit uncomfortable, but you were able to do it. So let's remember that as we were talking toward the end about how we can overcome or deal with our implicit biases. Okay, so... For those of you who have done this part with me before, the next part is actually good because I have people, including Jeff Brosco, who has been in this talk with me probably like 10 times and still, like, the, the effect is still going to be the same. So, everyone clap. Okay, let's do that together. Let's clap together. One, two, three. Perfect. And then tap. Perfect. Okay. You guys are going to clap when you see an insect or unpleasant word. Okay, so when you see an insect word or an unpleasant word, you're going to clap. A flower or a pleasant word, you're going to tap. You got it? Okay, you guys can do this. I know it's after lunch. Is it lunch time? I haven't had lunch yet. We need lunch. <laughs> We're a little bit slow because of that, but you can do it. Okay, ready, set, go. Wait, no, it's I kind of up. Up. <laughs> Okay, wait, some people can't see it. Okay, Sorry. do you want to stand up or? Sorry. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> good? Okay. okay, let's start over. Let's start over. Let's do it again. All right, ready, set, go. <laughs> Perfect. Good job, guys. Okay, we started off a little rough. We got it. We got through it together as a group. That's great. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to switch it up. <laughs> I'm going to switch it up a little bit, okay? So now... I want you to clap if you see an insect or a pleasant word. <laughs> you can do it. You're already being hard on yourself. And then tap if you see a flower or unpleasant word. Okay, so clap for insect or pleasant word. Tap for flower or unpleasant word. So it's switched, but you can still do it. Okay, ready, set, go. before having you yeah. <laughs> by the end you guys are not the only group that plays patty cake at the end we all we all do okay so i have you guys have demonstrated you guys have just taken an implicit association test in iet and you have demonstrated that you have a bias against insects oh yep. shocking shocking no, but why, before we talk about that, why can I confidently make that assertion that as a group, you guys have a bias against inse insects? That you always get it right faster. What, say that again? That you're getting it right faster. Like with, with which one, though? The clapping. The clapping. So, yeah. So, initially, right, I had insect, insect paired with unpleasant words. And you guys, those two things in your brain are linked, right? So most people in America don't like insects. There's always a few who are like, no, insects are my friends. I apologize <laughs> for, for stereotyping the entire country. But most of us do not like insects, right? 
So it's easier for us to pair insect with unpleasant word, right? But when I switch it and I ask you to pair insect with pleasant word, it's harder for you. It takes you a little bit longer, right? So by the end, so you guys were sort of like, uh, I don't really know. And you guys were, you guys were in favor of flowers, right? We like flowers in our culture, right? We think they're pretty. We think they're pleasant. We give them to each other. So it was easy for you to pair flowers with pleasant words. But when I asked you to pair flower with unpleasant words, it was more challenging. So this is the implicit association test. And I usually pause here to see if there's any questions, because usually questions about the test come up here. Um, and I can anticipate one of them. So one of the questions I usually get is, but Dr. Reynolds, what if you had given us insect with pleasant words first, right? That's usually the question. That's like a fair question, right? That people usually want to know. Because the thought is maybe it's just that I, I got used to doing instant with pleasant words and uh, with unpleasant words. And then if you had done this way first, I would have gotten used to it that way. So the, the researchers up at Harvard, um, Project Implicit, um, half of the time when you log in and you take an IAT, half of the time you get the intact association first, and the other half of the time you get the discordant association first. And there's no statistical difference between the two. So I could have given you this first, insects and pleasant words, and we would have just been playing patty cake first. And I always think that that's a little bit mean. So <laughs> I give you the other way first. But that's a really valid question. But it actually doesn't matter because that, that, the strength of that association is so great between insects and unpleasant words. We don't like insects. So it doesn't matter if I had given you this way first. So that's one of the questions that's usually asked. Are there any other questions before we watch a quick video? I had a question. Yeah. Um, so for insects, you also associate it with wasps. And wasps is a bug that has a stinger. So what, what would it have changed if you did like an insect, but you did like more of an insect that was like a butterfly? Oh, ooh, I like that. I don't know, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in there next time. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in there. That's interesting. Yeah. So we like in our culture. I bet. Oh my goodness. You want to do research on me? That's great. No, no. no, I've never. I've never thought about that. I bet you. It's a trap. That's like a I bet you. I bet you that if I did that, that might shake things up a bit. I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it and see. I don't know. Did, like when when you when you reverse, I was like, oh wait, now I have to think differently. So when you said unpleasant, and instead I was thinking like a roach. And I just switched to a butterfly, a ladybug, or just a caterpillar. And even then, like, I still messed up. You still, you're still going to mess up, but it, it helps a little bit. It helps. So what you did, you illustrated, we're going to talk about this a little bit, is you, you tried to prime your brain. Mm -hmm. So you tried to prime and say, if I think of a ladybug, maybe that'll help me. Yeah. You actually illustrated one of the ways to overcome implicit bias like that is literally one of the things to do that that's been shown in the research that can be done and if you do that before you take an IET you can lower your implicit bias against bugs if you're taking a bug IET like we just did um it doesn't completely go away but you can reduce it so thank you for sharing yeah last question is there like a difference in speed so we all did it as a group so if i hear someone else clap i might be more inclined to clap uh -huh. the group so there's like a group bias yeah so has there been like a like the same test done with like a group of people and then each person individual to see if there's like a difference in speed yeah so um yes yeah, so the the actual test the way you do it is on the computer you can actually do it on your phone too on a touch screen so it's an individual thing i do it as a group just to like like kind of like diffuse it a little bit because it's you know just to we're all in this together, right? We're all biased against insects together. But actually, I'm going to show you a video now that talks about bias. And, and they do it similarly, but it is individual. Could a dizzying series that it's a little images bit of bug fuzzy. associations reveal racial preferences you never knew you had? Could these blurry images reveal much more about you than you ever wanted anyone else to know? I should warn you now, this isn't the same order. <laughs> these two psychologists designed the test and say that's exactly what the experiment does. And they say you'll understand exactly how once you watch it closely. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, here it is. Let's see how Rhonda fares. In the first half of the test, she's told to associate negative words and black faces with the left box, positive words and white faces with the right. Left, right, 
Right. For instance, left. the word war appears. She correctly links it to the left box, which says bad and has a black face. Then there's a black face. Once again, the left box. Left, right, right, mm -hmm. left, right. She just as easily links the word peace to the right box, marked good with a white face. Right. And when a white face flashes onto the screen, Rhonda also matches that with the right box. But let's see how she does when the information is reversed, when the left box, marked bad, has a white face, and the right box, labeled good, has a black face. Left, left. Suddenly right, the test right, becomes much more right, difficult left, for Rhonda. About a third left, of the way through, right, she makes right. a mistake, linking the white face to the right box, even though that shows a black face. <laughs> I lost it. Okay. <laughs> Has Rhonda stumbled uh, because she unconsciously associates white with good? What would you imagine your score might indicate? Well, I could tell when I was taking it, I had so much of an easier time doing the white with good, much to my dismay, that I'm sure I'm showing a, a preference. I don't know how strong, and I'm kind of scared to find out, actually. <laughs> in, in fact, the test is showing a strong preference for whites. It's, it's upsetting, but it's, I'm, as I said before, I'm not surprised. And I think it's because we live in an extremely racist society where messages are given to us in many different ways. We may not be as impartial as we think we are. Absolutely. In fact, chances are we're not. Chances are we're not. Yes. Something like 79 or 80 percent of white Americans who take the test show a preference for white over black. Just 17 percent of whites show a preference for African Americans. And all of these results occurred even though we put this test to its toughest challenge, testing men and women with a dedicated commitment to racial equality. People like Jeff, who once marched with Martin Luther King Jr. All of those things um, tell me who I am as a person. And Rhonda. An attorney. But I've spent um, the last 10 to 15 years being a civil rights lawyer and, and trying to do some good in the world, but that doesn't make me immune from my own internal prejudices, and I think I just need to work on that. Questions? About the IAT or anything? So you can actually go to implicit.harvard.edu and take an IAT. Um, there's lots of different IAT. They actually just added an IAT on Donald Trump. Hey. And I, I guess they're testing whether or not there's a bias that American have, Americans have against Donald Trump. So that's interesting. I haven't taken that one yet. Um, but there's lots of different IATs. There's a race IAT, the gender IAT. A little anecdote that I like to mention here. Um, the One of the researchers, I think it's Dr. Banaji in that, that prior video. Um, so she is one of the folks that came up with the IAT. She helped develop it. She's a woman in science up at Harvard. I, that's her career. And so there's an IAT that she helped develop called the Women in Science IAT. That's testing the association that we have between women being in science versus women being in the home. And so she took that IAT and she scored a very strong bias against women being in science. And she herself is a woman. So that just sort of like underlies and illustrates like how powerful these unconscious biases are. Um, another like quick anecdote that I like to give. When I say that there's a lot of different IATs, there's actually an IAT that's called the weapons IAT. When I first took the weapons IAT, I thought it was going to be testing my association between like common weapons, like a gun or a knife. And, you know, a certain, you know, type of face or, you know, either a black face or a white face. And it's actually testing the association between black and white faces and weapons that are like medieval torture weapons. So like a guillotine and like a, I don't know, a bow and arrow and a spear, like things that we don't see anymore, right? That you see when you watch, I don't know, Game of Thrones, maybe, I guess, like one of those type of shows, but we don't see those type of weapons anymore. And if anything, you would link those weapons with more European, right? Like those are the type of European type weapons. Um, and the researchers have shown that most Americans, you know, have a bias where they link those medieval torture weapons with black faces.
And so there's something really insidious going on. There's something else going on. It's not just so much about, um, because one of the questions I get is, you know, could it just be that, you know, if you're black or if you're white, you might just have a preference towards your own, right? Like that makes sense, right? You would think that if your mom is white, right, maybe you just have a bias toward white people because that's what you've seen your whole life. Um, interestingly, so 80, about 80% 80 of white Americans have a bias um, against black American or against black faces um, as measured by the IAT and about 50% of black <coughs> Americans have that same bias. So 50% of black Americans have a bias against black faces as measured by the IAT. So it's less, but it's still a significant number, right? So it's not just that you're biased toward your own. There's something else that's going on. Any other questions or concerns? Um, so what, is the, what's, uh, what does this have to do with health disparities, right? Um, so in 2001, the Institute of Medicine actually um, commissioned or, or wrote a report, it was commissioned by Congress actually, looking at racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. And what they found when they looked at studies was that for black, it was specifically looking at black Americans in this country. So we know that there's certain health disparities, right? But those, there were also disparities in care, in the way we care for those patients. And you know, we used to think that if there are disparities in care, it could be that there's less access to care. These are patients who have less income, um, things like that, that would sort of like make sense and contribute to any disparities. But actually, they, they looked at the studies and they realized that you could control for income, education, insurance access, even where the person lives, right? And there would still be those differences. So there would still be disparities in how in the patients that receive care and how much care they receive and the type of care. So some of it is patient preferences, right? Some of that difference in the quality of health care. Some of it is things like insurance status and poverty and things along those lines. But a certain percentage of it is biases, stereotyping, and uncertainty on the part of healthcare professionals, on the part of essentially me, right, my my group. Um, because again, when we control for those other things, we were still seeing those disparities. And so then people started doing studies, looking at implicit bias, right? And saying, is bias contributing to health disparities? And because of time, I'm not going to go through every single study, um, but there are preponderance of studies that show that if you have a bias, let's say against you know black faces as measured by the IAT, or you have a preference for whites, it actually affects the way you care for those patients. So this particular study was just showing that in a large academic medical center, which is similar to to this one, um, and the hospital is a tertiary care center that. That is the safety net hospital in that particular area. This is actually in Utah, which sounds very similar to, to Jackson, right? Um, so people who are there are presumably there because they want to do some good in the world, right? They want to they want to make a difference. Um, and they actually gave the IAT to primary care physicians and then also community members, and they showed that their biases basically mirrored that of the general population. And out of all the studies that, that are cited in the bias literature, oh, pretty much all of them, the, our biases are, are mirroring the general population. So about 80% or so in terms of pro-white bias. This particular study, and it's actually been replicated, um, but they looked at US emergency departments and they looked at oh, you know thousands and thousands of cases patients who presented with a long bone fracture. So I've never broken my leg or my arm, but has anyone ever done that? I've heard it's very, very painful. So one of the, the standards of care is when you break your leg or your arm, if you have any fracture, um, hospitals actually track the time till you get your opioid, right? Because we don't want our patients to be in pain. It's gonna increase their heart rate, it's gonna increase their blood pressure, right? So we wanna get their pain under control. So they actually looked at patients who were of Hispanic ethnicity, so that is a huge group, um, and showed that they were less likely to receive any opioids. 
at all. So imagine going to the hospital with a fracture and not getting any pain medication at all. Um, the same has been shown for black patients. They actually, unfortunately, replicated the study in children, and they looked at children with appendicitis. And they showed that black and Hispanic children were less likely to get any opioids for appendicitis. Again, that's typically the treatment of choice for severe pain, and appendicitis causes severe pain. Um, and then when you were getting any kind of treatment for your pain, you were less likely to get opioids. So you were given either acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, or ibuprofen, which is Motrin. Um, and this is pretty much across the board and across the country. Um, this particular study looked at implicit bias and then whether, so they measured bias by the IET, and then they asked physicians, you know, they gave them a patient presentation of a patient having a stroke. And you either got the white patient or the black patient. Um, and if you had a pro-white bias, you were less likely to recommend the appropriate treatment for stroke, which is thrombolysis. And thrombolysis has to be done within a certain amount of time. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the treatment for, for stroke, essentially breaking up the, the clot in the brain. Um, but the patients in the clinical vignettes that they gave were, were identical. The only thing that was different was the race. But if you had a pro-white bias, you were less likely to recommend the thrombolysis. This particular study I just throw out because it's in pediatrics. So pediatricians, we pat ourselves on the back because if you look at the IET, we have slightly less bias, right? So those working with kids, I, I can, I think, extrapolate, we tend to have a little bit less bias than like the general population. But um, as I said, when we're treating pain, we, we, if we do have that pro-white bias, we, we are still going to be prescribing the, you know, not appropriate treatment and for other um, disorders as well. This particular slide I like to show so we talked about explicit versus, oh, question. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, how did they eliminate other reasons other than the ones you're mentioning for not providing, you know, the opioid? So in the, so, right, in the real life examples, it's hard to do that, right? Yeah. It's hard to do that. Um, sometimes what they do is they will, uh, what they will do is they will, um, they will match up, so make things pretty similar. So they'll look at two patients and they have the same income, they have the same insurance. Because it was such a large, you know, national sample, they can they can do that. Um so like a almost like a case control situation. So you can match them up and essentially what would be the only thing that's different would be their race or ethnicity. But it's very difficult. It's very difficult to say specifically. This is why they're not getting the pain medication. However, presumably, if a patient's coming into the ER for a long bone fracture, that we know, we're, we're taught as physicians that that counts as severe pain. So they should be getting an opioid kind of regardless. Um, so, but it, it, you're right, it is hard to say in those, in those real life studies what, what could be the other factors that are at play. Um, Something to note as well, just in when we're assessing things like pain, is that when we are assessing patients um, who are black or who are different from us, might have a different ethnicity than us, the studies show that we are less reliable in assessing their pain. So if you, they've actually done studies where they've put um, computer-generated computer faces that are grimacing, um, a black face and a white face, the same facial expression, um, and people are less likely to, to rate the pain as being the same between the two. So there's some, the thing about pain is that it's so subjective, right? So like I have to actually believe that you're in pain in order for me to say, okay, let me give you your pain medication. So that's where, um, and there, there's been a lot of different studies on a lot of different treatment outcomes that have shown those differences, but pain is the one that is so subjective. And when we think about our patients with sickle cell disease, other painful disorders, like I said, even appendicitis, is something that we definitely want to keep in mind. And then this particular slide, I'll just go through it really quickly. So we talk about explicit versus implicit bias, right? So explicit bias is saying, I don't, let's just say for the sake of this slide, saying I don't like black people, right? Like very few people actually say that. Um, but you might have a high level of implicit bias, so it's unconscious. You're not aware of it. Um, <clears throat> so 
individuals with low explicit bias, right? So these are the people that say, I treat everyone the same. I have no, I treat, you know, I have, there's no difference between people. They might even say things like, I don't see color, that type of thing, right? They want to treat everyone the same. But if they have a high level of implicit bias, those, those um, physicians or individuals are rated, in this study was physicians, are rated lower in terms of patient satisfaction, their patient reactions to them, then even people who have high explicit, the high explicit bias means you're walking around like, I don't like you because you're black. I don't, like, people don't really do that very much, but there's some people that do. Yeah. These folks, right, this group right here, they have high explicit, but also high implicit bias, right? They get better patient evaluations than people who think they're doing the right thing, but their implicit bias is showing without them recognizing it. So that's just something to really keep in mind is that we may think that we are treating, we're being egalitarian and treating everyone the same, but people can pick up on sort of those, those cues, right? Those, those unsaid kind of gestures and facial expressions. They've shown that, you know, when you're in, a, in an encounter, um, if there's bias involved, you're less likely to, to go up to the person. Let's say you're giving a diagnosis, right? To go up or to, you know, put your, your hand on the shoulder, which would be appropriate in our culture, right? It's all culture specific because in some cultures you don't want to do what I just said, right? Or to give like good eye contact. That's also important in our culture. You're less likely to do that. You're more likely to stand farther away, right? And to not look the person in the eye, things like that. So people really are picking up on some of those things. Yeah. Um, maybe, okay, we'll go into that high explicit, high implicit. Yeah, these maybe, people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe that person is just so sure of, I guess, who they are, how they think, because they, I guess, accepted what, how, no matter how wrong or how right it is. Yeah. When it comes to patient care, they're like, no, this has to be it. And then the patient gets better, and then the patient ends up reporting the positive. Whereas the one with the low explicit and high implicit, they're, like you said, it's the type of person where it's like, oh, like I see no color or whatever. But then deep down, there's just so much going on that sometimes the patient picks up on any kind of insecurity or insurance. Yeah, exactly. I think so. So we are, as humans, we like when what we see is what we get, right? Like we like, like even if you're telling me you don't like me and then you act that way, I'm, I'm, I might not be okay with it, but I know what I'm getting, right? But if you tell me that you like me, but then you treat me like you don't, it, it makes us uncomfortable, right? So people can, people can pick up on that. Um, we talk, we'll just get through some of these. Um, so is there hope? Yes. Although we all have biases and although they are unconscious, it's important to work toward recognizing them so that we can work toward consciously meeting meeting them. So the first step is recognition. So I encourage, if you have not already taken an IAT, to go to implicit.harvard.edu and take an IAT. Um, Keep in mind that implicit bias, so the first time I took an IAT, I cried, right? I did. I knew all of the data. I knew all of the literature. But when I took it, I cried, right? Because it is jarring. It is jarring to recognize that you have these biases, that you have to keep in mind that no one is saying that you're a bad person. What I'm saying is that you're a person. <laughs> you are a human being. You have these biases. We all have them. We have to recognize them. So recognizing them is the first step. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, so what's the next step? How can you overcome these biases? We're actually running out of time, but I'm just going to quickly, if it's okay, just take two minutes to quickly go through some of the evidence-based ways that we can um, override our biases. So it's very difficult to completely change your bias. There's some things you can do to change it in the short term. So if I give you the IAT, let's say I give you the race IAT, right, with the black and white faces, and then I show you a picture of a prominent black person or a black person that you tend to like, right, that you, you aspire to be like or that you have an affinity toward. Um, let's say I show you a picture of Oprah. I don't know. People like Oprah, right? For the most part, yeah, mostly. I used to show Bill Cosby because he was, you know, no. but <laughs> we're not going there. We can't do that anymore. Um, so you can have a very temporary change in your IAT just, just from me showing you a picture of Oprah before you take the race IAT. Um, but without sustained 
engagement in your biases and really checking into them, your IAT is going to go right back. It's going to flip right back pretty almost immediately. So there are some things that we can do over time to help to override our biases. And some of them, with sustained effort, you can actually change your IAT and actually lessen your amount of implicit bias. So all of this is based on the literature, but this is sort of like the little mnemonic that I came up with to help me to remember it. And it's check your biases. So connect, honor, engage, and communicate with kindness. So let's quickly go through them. Connect. So the first step in mitigating bias is acknowledging it. That's why I'm asking you to take the IAC. So you have to connect with your bias. If you don't know what your biases are, you're going to be perpetuating them without you knowing. You just are, right? It's just, it's very, very powerful. So the first step is knowing about your bias. This, um, this study, um, I'll just go through it very quick. So they looked at medical, student, medical students across the country, um, gave them the IAT in their first year and then the IAT in their fourth year, and looked at whether or not there were any changes to their, to their implicit biases measured by the IAT. So the students who had a professor who was more likely to make disparaging remarks about minorities or about black patients were more likely to have an increase in their implicit bias over time. And then the students who had a, a professor or someone that they looked up to that was of that, that minority group that they were biased against so it had decreases in their bias over time. But the key is just taking the IAT, just taking it at some point in medical school showed a decrease in the implicit bias as measured by the IAT. Just taking it, just being aware, that is the first step. And that's why that is so incredibly powerful. So usually I have people take it, but we don't have time for that. Um, so the next thing is to honor. So honor your bias. So I'm not saying to walk around and be like, woohoo, I'm biased against women. Yes, don't do that, right? Let's not do that. But what I do want you to do is if you, if you, the IAT has determined, or if you've determined that you have an implicit bias against women, right, and then you're about to go through a hiring process, and there's women candidates, you have to honor, you have to recognize that you have that bias within yourself in that moment. You have, because you've already connected with it, right? So now you have to actually recognize when that bias is being activated. Maybe you walk into a room to see a patient and the patient's a woman, and you don't really, for some reason, you kind of, kind of get a funny feeling that you probably would have pushed aside before. Recognize that that could be your implicit bias coming into play. But you have to take that, that moment to just pause and say, is this my bias coming into play? So when I drive, you know, sometimes I work late when I'm on service here in the hospital, and I leave pretty late, and I'm driving down the street, and... Um, Someone is walking toward me, right? What's the first thing I do? Lock my door, right? So I, I, I'm going to still lock my door, right? I'm going to do that. But I always take a second and I pause. And I say, did I lock my door because that was the best and safest thing for me to do? Or did I lock my door because there's some sort of bias involved? I always do that every single time. And a lot of times, it's just because it's like 11 o'clock at night. I don't care who's walking toward me at 11 o'clock at night. Right? Like, I'm going to lock my door. But there are times, there are times that I have had to check myself and say, Kim, I don't call myself Dr. Reynolds. <laughs> so Kim, Kim, why did you do that? You did that probably because of your bias. And that is hard. It is hard to call yourself out. But it is necessary if you want to have that sustained engagement with your bias in order to change it, right? So when I see a gentleman walking toward me, sometimes you don't see the full picture, right? Sometimes you don't see the full picture and you kind of make those snap judgments because that's what we all do. But it's just about recognizing them. Um, so do a self audit. Um, this is a video about how to do that, but we're gonna skip that. Engage with your bias, that's the E. So engage, I mean challenge it. You have to challenge your bias, right? So when I see that person, that, that gentleman walking toward me, and I, and I lock the door, and then I'm like, should I have done that? And I say to myself, no. And then I try to figure out why. Why did I do that, right? And then in another situation, I, have, I can do some of these things, stereotype replacement and counter-stereotypic imaging. Counter-stereotypic imaging is just... Um, Taking a stereotype like Oprah, right? like saying someone like Oprah, right? 
she is a prominent black woman and a leader, right? So if I look at her before I take the women in science or the women in leadership IAT, I might decrease my score. Third type replacement is doing this, right? So we have woman paired with leader, provider, assertive, strong, and driven. We have a man provide, paired with supportive, emotional, helpful, sensitive, and fragile. That's stereotype replacement, right? I'm replacing those two stereotypes in my mind because in our society, those would be flipped, right? Unfortunately, but that's, that's just the, the reality. Being called a policewoman doesn't bother me at all because I know it covers those women and men. Andrew, policewoman, age 40. What? <laughs> right? Like, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> we would never call Andrew a policewoman because we know it covers everyone, right? But we do that for women, right? We say, oh, policeman, oh, you know, it covers everyone, right? That's an example of stereotype replacement. This actually, this account, like, it does this. All, if you want to follow them on Twitter, they do this all day long, where they take, like, common stereotypes and they flip them. And it makes it kind of humorous, but it also helps to challenge your biases. And then real quick, um, uh, there's Oprah, okay. <laughs> so communicate with kindness. So you're communi in all of this, you're only talking to yourself, right? You're communicating with yourself. So you're disproving stereotypes with internal dialogue and experiences. But I like to say communicate with kindness because if you just beat yourself up all day, that's not really helpful, right? You have these biases because you're a human, because you're a person, okay? And they're unconscious. But... The first step is to just know about them. And if you go through these processes, there has been evidence that you can change your bias and begin to treat everyone egalitarian and to begin to kind of live out the ideals that I think we all would probably want to, to live out. Um, those are my references. Sorry, the last part I had to, to rush through. But if you have any questions about any of this, I'm happy to share with you. So thank you guys so much for your